welcome back to our discussion on svms so far we looked at svms considering the linear case then we looked at svms for a case where there are outliers where there is a separability concern because of outliers and also we saw that could potentially help us with overfitting and now here we are going to look at nonlinear SVMs. So suppose we have something like this in the second bullet point here, something like this, where we have some red data points and we have some red data points on the other side. And in the middle, we have some blue data points. So this, these blue data points are not outliers essentially because they seem like they occur together, right? But this data set is also not linearly separable. You need something more than a line to separate them. To do that, we need a model which is essentially not linear, right? Something like maybe a circle here like I have drawn or maybe you need a polynomial something in this shape to separate these two sets of data points and SVMs can do that pretty easily preserving the linear model that we learned so nothing essentially will change except for the part where we identified the kernel and that's why SVMs are really powerful and that is called the kernel trick how do you extend SVMs to work for a non-linear case? And the answer for that question is the kernel trick. SVM, a non-linear SVM is constructed by using a linear SVM and in that we employ the kernel trick. Right? So we already identified the kernel in the previous videos. We are going to just go over and now we are going to concretize this idea of what is a kernel and how it is used in a nonlinear SVM. So the motivation for kernel trick is that linear classifiers are really well understood, widely used and are also efficient if our data is linearly separable. Now, can we use linear classifiers to build nonlinear ones? And this is something we have not considered before, right? We considered neural networks where we have nonlinear classifiers by using a network of these linear classifiers called perceptrons. Here in SVMs, we are going to consider a slightly different way to do the same thing we are going to map the input space to a new higher dimensional space, a transformation on your features x to give v of x, which is our newer high dimensional space. And then using this nonlinear transformation, we use this nonlinear transformation in the part which is called the kernel and a linear model in this new higher dimensional space now is equivalent to a nonlinear model in the input space. So this is slightly difficult to understand so um, just bear with me and we'll go over this just one more time just to you know get this idea so we have our input space x and then we have a higher dimensional space v of x so now this is our original input space right and this is high dimensional so what we are essentially saying is that we have we constructed a linear model for our input space x right instead of constructing a nonlinear model in our input x space 
we are going to transform it to a higher dimensional space and in the high dimensional space we are going to consider a linear model so a linear model in the higher dimensional phi of x space is equivalent to a nonlinear model in the input space This is phi of x, feature space. And this is x, a linear model in the feature space, phi of x, or new high dimensional space, corresponds to a nonlinear model in the input space. So, visualizing this, it looks something like this. This is a gross approximation or just for visualization purposes in the input set let's say you will have two dimensional data and then we have something like this so this is not linearly separable something on the left is not linearly separable and we need a circle right something non-linear to separate it now in this space we need a nonlinear model in our original input space. Now we make a transformation x to phi of x. And now our data becomes something like this. So when we make the transformation, we add a dimension. So we had only two dimensions, right? This is the new dimension that we have added. And now in, when we have these three dimensions, our data has a different looks very different and in this space we can now construct a linear model on p of x nonlinear on x linear on phi of x so now this model right here which is given by the dotted plane here now this is a linear model right in three dimensions a linear model is a plane in n dimensions a linear model would be a n dimensional hyperplane right so that is what essentially we are doing here we need a nonlinear model we make a transformation and then we use a linear model in on the transformation on our transformed x v of x so we can still solve this problem but not really complicate the model keep the model linear so that is what svms do so suppose we have v of x we our function now would become w transpose v of x plus b so that's what we are is our equation of our classifier now we need our kernel here where we define that by v of x i transpose v of x j now this is similar to the inner dot product that we got in the dual optimization problem we have the inner dot product right so we can replace that with phi and that is called a kernel function now let's look at a very simple kernel polynomial kernel so polynomial kernel is defined by 1 plus xi transpose xj the whole square so this is the polynomial kernel that's how the polynomial kernel is defined so we know that we need to have our kernel in this format phi of xi transpose phi of xj right in this format 
So essentially, what we need to do is that we need to separate xi, xi, and xj. Separate them into two vectors and then multiply them to get this product. So if we can show that, then we can show that the polynomial kernel can be represented using our SVM kernel trick. So we take the kernel, which is the polynomial kernel, 1 plus xi transpose xj the whole square. Now we expand it. And then we construct two vectors here. One has only i. And the other one has all j. So we just essentially separate i and j so that we can get it in this format phi of xi transpose multiplied by phi of xj. Now, because we have everything in i in the first and everything in j in the second, then we can say that this is equivalent to phi of xi transpose phi of xj, where phi is the function that transforms xi into phi of xi. So now if you see here, they look pretty much similar, right? So 1 xi square. Now here in the second one, we have xj 1 square. Square root of xi 1, xi 2. Here we have square root of xj 1, xj 2. Then we have xi2 square, we have xj2 square. Square root of xi1, square root of xj1. Square root of 2, xi2, square root of 2, xj2. So we have the same, essentially a similar vector, except that one is for xi, and the other one is for xj. So we can construct this. So I'm not going to go into this detail because it's just, multiplication right you can multiply these these two vectors and see if it comes to the polynomial kernel but essentially what I'm trying to tell you is that once we have this transformation phi of xi and then we can use phi of xi transpose phi of xj this product as our kernel and then our feature x has been transformed into the space of phi of x and in that high dimensional space in phi of x we now construct a linear model and then we see if that performs better and we essentially to solve a problem using svms we try out different kernels for example there is the linear kernel that we already already know that uh, we derived the um, solution for we solved the primal and dual versions there is a polynomial kernel which we just looked at so this is the version and it can be separated into phi of xi and x transpose phi of xj for some phi and that's used to construct the polynomial kernel there is the gaussian kernel and there is a sigmoid kernel. So these are the most commonly used kernels in SVMs. We essentially try out different kernels and then see if in that transformed space in phi of x, in this new high dimensional space, is our model performing better? Have we achieved linear separability in that space? And is our model performing better if it is performing better then we choose that so first we start with the simpler one remember Occam's razor overfitting we don't want to use a more complex model right at the beginning we want to use start with the simplest model linear and then go on to polynomial and then Gaussian and then sigmoid and try one of one or the one after another to see which one fits better and then choose that there are also much more complex kernels that um, people have used, but for most normal problems, we don't need so much complex models. That is the reality. So that's why you start small and then build up.
So essentially in support vector machines, our path to solve any problem using SVMs takes this course. You choose a kernel function and then you also choose a value for C. It is like your regularization coefficient. You choose a value for it to see how much weight do you need to give to ass assign to the slack variables. So you choose a value for C. C, remember C is the coefficient for slack, slack variables, right? Now, you have a quadratic programming problem and software packages are available, solve them using, solve the problem using them. Pick one of those solvers and use the solvers to solve it. And then after you solve it, you need to construct the function that you are going to use to, to classify. So after you solve it, you substitute it back and then you construct. So you learn the weights, you learn um, the value of B and uh, then you solve for that and then you construct the line or plane equation, the linear equation using the in the kernel space, whichever kernel you chose and that would be your final model and using that model, the learned model, you're going to make the classification, right? So after you solve for it, so what are you solving for? You're solving for all the variables such as W, B, and so on, and Lagrange, etc., right? And when you solve for it, for all of them, then you can substitute them back. And then now you know everything to construct your model. So that is what is called the discriminant function. Right, so you need to construct the model, the plane, W transpose phi of x plus b, and then using this, you solve the test data set. And then after you have the predictions for the test data set, you can compute the prediction scores and report them back. So this concludes our discussion on support vector machines. We learned a lot of concepts and all these come together and make them incrementally more challenging and more complex and more interesting and hope you liked all of them and um, definitely go through all of them multiple times to understand this better. This is not an easy concept and I would highly encourage you to look at this multiple times to get this idea uh, of support vector machines and appreciate it and enjoy it. All right, I'll see you again in our next topic. Thank you.